This is Gabrielle again with This Millennial Nation. And right now we are met with Amanda Signorelli, who is with Tech Week. And right before we went on, I was asking her, like, what is your title? And in classic startup culture, she has, what, six different business cards, totally depending on the day, depends on what it is that she's doing. And it's kind of all hands on deck when it comes down to, to startup. So Amanda, thanks so much for joining us. <laughs> Absolutely, no, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be able to have this opportunity. So I want to jump right into it about what the next generation of entrepreneurship looks like. At Tech Week, you are exposed to hundreds of entrepreneurs who have great ideas and who are seeking to actualize those into companies that they can there, um, go forward and run with. What have you noticed is different about this next generation of entrepreneurs? I think the big thing I've noticed is the sense of empowerment. One of the key pieces that you see across the millennial generation is no matter what, an entrepreneur in its own essence kind of remains a static concept where it's the idea of actually going forward, being innovative, and starting your own business, right? But then how that gets characterized in our generation is kind of this idea of how you face both the idea of taking initiative and then also accepting the risks that come with it. And the millennial generation, more so than I think than any other, is very much risk loving in the sense of I feel empowered to have the opportunity to make a difference at my age. And I feel like I have the skills and I see the stories and the community behind me to support myself in that idea and to push forward and say, this doesn't have to be me when I'm age 40. It doesn't have to be me when I'm an adult and learned as much as I need to. It can be right now. I don't need to know everything, but I can figure it out. And that idea of I can figure it out and I'm empowered to do so is really, really unique. You see that across the board because you'll talk to entrepreneurs and they'll say, I didn't really know what I was doing, but I knew I could try and figure it out or I could get there, which is amazing. And you would probably say that that's pretty similar to your own journey, would you not, of kind of realizing that traditional workforce infrastructure wasn't for you, you wanted something outside of the box. Yeah, absolutely. For me, I didn't necessarily like the idea of having this very constant way of looking at a career progression. You come in as an analyst and you become a senior analyst and then you go here and you move up the ranks as it goes. And it's very much dead set in terms of the infrastructure that you have to follow, the process and the skills that you have to develop. But besides that, if you step, take a step farther and say, what if you leapfrog? What if you force yourself to take on even more? Then your growth just completely compounds upon itself and the opportunities become significant significantly more immense and the ceiling itself goes up, right? If you think about following just the career tra the traditional career trajectories, you find yourself at this one level and you think, okay, well, that's phenomenal and that's great and maybe there's a lot of people that are excited about that. But for me, I want to say what's the maximum potential I could possibly get to? What is even more that I could aspire to be? What if I tried to pursue my dreams that aren't necessarily defined by the title? So would you say that this next generation is more or less entrepreneurial than other generations? I think it's significantly more. And I think a lot of that has to do with the exposure because now there's this idea of you can do anything and this do it yourself mentality has transcended itself beyond the idea of trying to figure out small problems that you may come across in terms of obstacles within your own work but rather saying on a greater scale what are issues that I see in the world around me now that I have exposure through technology whether that's social media whether that's me following more news because I have access to it across numerous outlets etc and being able to see what's around you you all of a sudden have this the observational capability to say what if I say I'm going to try and solve problems that are greater than myself because I can see them and there's these aha moments that pop out more and more often when you talk to entrepreneurs they, and they think there has to be a better way I have to be able to fix this I have to be able to do this there's no way that there's not a really amazing way for me to do this and potentially make an impact that means even more. And being able to have the observational capabilities and the information to even see that in the first place is the strongest point where I see so many of the entrepreneurs coming out with their ideas. So you're dealing with entrepreneurs who are coming from all walks of life and even all ages as well. What would you say is the biggest challenge that entrepreneurs are facing when it comes to starting a business? I think, I hate to admit this, I really do, but at the end of the day, it comes down to more often than not when I ask people, what do you need? What can I help you with? What can I do? The answer is capital. Without capital to infuse it, to actually grow, to scale, to hire the talent, 
to get the subscriptions to the different APIs that they need, all these different pieces, they're constantly constrained. And so that capital can come in through friends and family. It comes through actually fundraising. It could come through actual rounds of investment with the different VCs. Maybe it's a CVC, whichever you have. But capital becomes one of the key elements. And I think that's actually interesting because what you see is a radical departure in where do I get that capital from across the United States. The nice thing about Tech Week is we focus on all the startups outside Silicon Valley. So Silicon Valley, you have all these different sources that you can go to and try and raise from, and everybody's kind of got the right VC or the right person that's willing to give you capital. Now you talk to an entrepreneur in one of our markets like Kansas City, and that becomes significantly more challenging. Where do you go to get capital from somebody that's going to help you grow your business? And what I think is interesting is how cities themselves have stepped in and say, hey, we care about entrepreneurs and we want to be able to provide the tools that we can to help develop entrepreneurship within an ecosystem, which is where you see programs like the KC Grant Program, where they award ten, fifty thousand dollars grants to companies just to help them get started, helping substitute that need for capital with just something as simple as a grant and support by a city, which is huge. So you guys are moving all around the country. I mean, you're in Los Angeles, you're in Chicago, uh, you're in New York, you're in Kansas City. What have you found in the different uh, entrepreneurial ecosystems is is differs across across the board. I mean, what have you noticed is native, and what have you noticed is across the board and and actually does correlate uh, to different cities in the United States? For sure, I think you definitely can see the classic trends that you would expect pop up, right? You'll find in New York, huge fintech scene. It's something that's really vibrant. It's growing. There's a lot of interesting technologies there, whether you're looking at something like blockchain or whether or not you're looking at something as simple as being able to understand your kind of 401k and different tools that will translate there. Something like Kansas City, you see trends come up there where Kansas City of itself is the animal life health sciences corridor of the nation. So you see technology within those trends popping out almost as kind of a response and a correlation to a lot of the corporations that are built out there. And then in Los Angeles, you see a lot of in, kind of industries focus on entertainment tech or if it's VR, et cetera. So you can see a lot of common trends that end up defining the different ecosystems where people really build ideas. And that makes sense from the idea of having some sort of system that really operates as a full community. Uh, the things that end up being similar end up with common problems such as capital again. And then the other piece is talent, always finding the best talent possible and being able to can actually convince them to stay there, right? Because entrepreneurs love to be inspired by each other. And so you'll end up with a lot of situations where I hear people say, I really want to join a startup, so I'm going to move to Silicon Valley. And I'm like, well, there's great startups all over the world, and there's great startups across the nation. Why do you have to go here just to be able to fill that need? So trying to actually connect to the talent to bring them in becomes incredibly powerful and is something that is definitely consistent across all the cities we operate in. I love that you're creating partnerships that are native to the cities that they're in because you're right, we all can't move to startup capitals and you know one way or the other because if we do, then you're losing out on innovation that's homegrown and that's how communities flourish and that's how they, they thrive and they even survive in, in all sorts of economic uh, situations. How have you seen that collaboration take place, especially using technology? We now live in a very global society where I can hire freelancers in other parts in the world, like Indonesia and China, to work on specific projects. But how have you seen collaboration happen even within those smaller communities? I think the big thing is realizing the different touch points, right? The best way to ensure the collaboration is beyond just kind of posting something on the web and saying, hey, I need a developer who's really good at coming up with creative interfaces for my UX because I'm going to build this app and it requires a lot of detail, right? You throw that out on the internet and you try and find something from there. But if you take it a step farther and say, those connections, while they are incredibly powerful, to hit needs or maybe that's your outsourcing process being able to find the right person from a connection standpoint becomes more valuable and having somebody that's an actual dedicated FTE that becomes a partner as opposed to just a person out on the web it's an interesting combination of trying to substitute the two together and so I find that within communities like Kansas City 
bringing them together and convening people is the most powerful thing that you could ask for because then it actually tells a story about you walk into a room and say hey I've never met you before what are you working on and then all of a sudden you see these great ideas come to life just because they're able to actually have this conversation so whether that's the pitch events that happen if it's the co-working spaces that open if it's the speakers that come in and it's about a topic that you're passionate about but creating those different ways to create the communication the environment and the collaboration all out of a touch point then it becomes more interesting because you can't just have this siloed world without this partner because the partner requires more of a relationship than just the transactional nature that you may be able to facilitate with somebody that you just find on a website would you say since a lot of your time is spent at tech week uh, working in the the startup and the tech competitions and kind of that getting that initial or expanded funding for startups do you think that there's a personality type that makes someone an entrepreneur yes absolutely one of the things I always kind of joke around with with all of the entrepreneurs that I know is that they don't seem to understand the concept of moderation which is I'm just gonna go 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 I'm gonna try and accomplish the world oh wait I completely forgot that I need to you know do simple things such as my DMV registration needs to be renewed or all of these other pieces because you become so passionate and obsessed with your business which is the best thing you could ask for right if you talk to an entrepreneur and they say you know tell me your idea and their response is well it's just this it's kind of along these lines they're not passionate and you know that that's not somebody that's willing to dedicate themselves and throw themselves into their project headlong but then when you talk to someone who gets riled up and says let me tell you about everything I'm doing this is my dream this is the vision this is what we can do next here's my MVP but guess what like 10 stages down the line I'm gonna have version you know, et cetera, that's going to be maxed out beyond belief. And when you have that type of passion, that's what you see to be common on the entrepreneurs that really pursue their dreams is they don't have that concept of moderation because they want to be that passionate. And that drive is something that's really, truly beautiful. Well, how many times have you been like, wait, did I eat today? <laughs> like, yeah. oh, wait, have, have we, um, you know, have, did we pay for the internet? Because I'm pretty sure we need that to continue going on. I mean, you get in the zone and it is almost this, obsession and it's something that I think people outside of that world don't necessarily understand and they think that it's unhealthy um, but also too you have to realize that it's a phase because you can't you can't do every day like that for 50 years I mean or even two years it gets it gets to be a point where you realize that you have to make the sacrifices now to get to the point of sustainability where it's going to actually kind of walk on its own and talk on its own and and that's the healthy place that we we want to be at um, I'd love for you to just take a moment and just share what it is that you guys are doing at Tech Week and how you are creating communities. Because when you hear Tech Week, a lot of communities have like a Tech Week. They're like, oh yeah, well we've got a, day, a week and we spotlight different communities or different startups or this and that. But you guys are taking it so much further than that and really creating a sustainable community and having those touch points of long-term relationships, not just you know the one night stand. So if you could share a little bit about that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So the mission for Tech Week is to build a better world through entrepreneurship, which in of itself sounds incredibly grandiose and one of those ideas where you think, how does that actually come to life? And so tactically, the way that we do this is we turn around and say, we are going to provide a national platform and a national spotlight to local ecosystems outside of the Silicon Valleys of the world that actually say, here is the story behind Kansas City, here's the story behind Detroit, here's the story behind Chicago, all the different cities that are still developing and emerging within their own rights as startup ecosystems. And so what we end up doing is combining an element of speakers who come in and provide content around disruptive ideas that reflect Flex themes that are relevant to each ecosystem. So something in Kansas City maybe focus a lot on big data or smart cities as you've got kind of Cisco in there doing a great job of trying to build it up as one of the largest smart cities within the US. Something like that. Then you'll also have the combination of the entrepreneurs themselves. Entrepreneurs build an ecosystem and start the businesses themselves and so they'll compete for the launch startup competition. Then you'll also have Founders House which is celebrating individuals who are part of tech companies that are these success stories where you really want to learn from them and hear what they're trying to accomplish and then you spread that out across an entire week and create additional touch points 
that you meet someone on Monday where maybe you're doing a coding workshop that's part of a Tech Week event, and then you see them again on Tuesday when you're touring different innovative office spaces, like the Brain Troop space here in Chicago, which we did back in 2015, and all of these opportunities to say, let's continue building on this conversation, and let's convene everybody together. Because our core belief is that Tech Week in of itself should be embodying, embodying an ecosystem and that means the entrepreneurs of it, the speakers of it, the ideas behind it, the actual moments in the city itself, so that you're not just at one location, but rather you're also seeing the co-working spaces and all the other places that entrepreneurs and technologists join together to come up with ideas and create products and potentially businesses down the road. I love everything about what you just said, um, <laughs> because it isn't just you know, those moments it's really something that's sustained, and that's how we're going to be successful, not only as individual entrepreneurs, but really community of entrepreneurs as well. I want to touch on two points that you mentioned. Um, the first was you were talking about coding workshops. What role do training and development opportunities play in helping entrepreneurs improve their skill set and become more viable? A huge. It's it's a huge need. Uh, even something as simple for our national Miami competition, we had somebody from General Assembly who was the head of operations there come in as a judge. And when I talked to her about what are some of the needs that she's filling, she's saying it. she has a lot of entrepreneurs that come to her and say, hey, I really don't know how to do X, Y, Z. What's the best way for me to get there? And there's this piece of you're going to learn by doing. Yes, you're going to learn by getting advice from the mentors and those that are your peers who are trusted advisors around you. But then there's also these opportunities for formal education that can give you the tools that you need to be able to figure it out. Since so the day, my favorite quote that I always hear people say to me is you don't know what you don't know. There's this vast world out there where you think you have a hunch, but until you actually sit down and get the information, you may not even know the right questions to ask. So if you can identify the gaps in your own knowledge and go out and source different ways to figure out and supplement that information and then turn around and have more educated questions to further your education itself, then all of a sudden that level of empowerment becomes even more extreme, which is phenomenal. Do you think that entrepreneurs need to have an MBA or any sort of formal training to do well? No, I think we've seen over and over again that you don't need that whatsoever. It's actually a really interesting topic for me in particular because I always thought that the answer was, oh, you get your MBA and then after that you start a business because you have all of this knowledge now that you'll be able to leverage to build a business. But the more I talk to entrepreneurs, the more I hear, hey, I had no idea what I was actually getting myself into, but I learned by actually doing. I didn't learn in a classroom. I didn't hear the, this is how you start a business 101 when I was sitting in a lecture hall. I just had to figure it out and it's a tough place to be because you also see businesses that are created out of these programs which are equally wonderful the same thing that you see for the Warby Parker story that came out of Wharton the same thing you see for Alfred's that came out of HBS so it's nothing to say that they're mutually exclusive you'll find them in any category but it's not to say that it's a prerequisite or some sort of a priori requirement that you need that information going in to start a business absolutely it's that um being open to learning as you're as you're going but i think it's incredible that we do have access to training and development uh things like you're offering at tech week and general assembly huge fans of theirs because now we're creating almost a real world mba where we can take these classes get the skills that we need quickly and get back out there so rather than having to spend all this time on theory we are in the middle of it and it's like, hey, hand me a wrench. <laughs> and you're just, yeah. just jumping in and, and trying to fix things as you, you go along. The second thing that I wanted to touch on was work environment. Now, people who are not millennials will oftentimes walk into a millennial centered or millennial run office and think, you know, where are the adults? There's, you know, it's a very flat leadership. It's very casual. It's a very different work environment. Maybe you can speak a little bit more to those um, modern work environments where we're noticing that people are really thriving and they're really able to bring their personalities to work with them. Yeah, absolutely. I think to your point, there's this idea of you can be yourself in a lot of these work environments. It's not about putting on a suit and tie and having a certain manner of speaking or requiring an actual way of holding yourself when you're going into a meeting and following those regimented rules of saying after you say Mrs. or Sir, et cetera, and continuing on that way. You can be very open and honest. And the more true you are to yourself, the more opportunities you have to tap into your own creativity because it creates the safe work environment that allows you to foster that type of 
of, uh, I'd say, courage to be open with your ideas. And being open to a personality, open to an idea, means the chance of that actually turning into something more becomes significant because now it's no longer you pitching an idea to your boss and hoping that it works its way up the chain but rather it's you within an open environment talking to your colleagues going over and actually taking the initiative and saying hey I want to try this out would you be interested in doing that as well because it's a casual environment it's a safe environment and it's open and that's something that's incredibly important for a lot of these startups to be able to succeed because the more structure you put in place the more you're constraining those conversations from even occurring in the first place what role do you think that disruption plays in how we as a generation are going into this world of entrepreneurship? Absolutely. So I'm actually a bit of a contrarian when it comes to disruption because I think that we use the word a lot and it's not always the best way of looking at it because at the end of the day, the way that you see these businesses form more often than not are not disruptive ideas, but they're incremental changes and they're novel applications of the same technology to a different use case or to a different problem and their evolutions. And so they're not necessarily turning a problem on its head. And sometimes we have this aspirational notion of the only way to really make a difference is completely disrupting something altogether as opposed to saying let's just make small changes that can be equally as valuable. You think of a classic example of something like ZocDoc. At the end of the day, ZocDoc is simply providing online booking for providers and these individual doctors. That's a very incremental change that could lead to a lot of disruptive forces later, but they're small things that end up building upon an evolution. And even today when I read a lot of applications from our startup comp um, competitors, I'll hear someone say, we're the scope for dating. We're the Uber for motorcycles. We're this, we're that, et cetera. And while they're using this as a way to be able to help you visualize what their business is as a pneumatic sense, there's also this element of actually looking and saying, you don't have to completely disrupt an industry. You can provide incremental changes. You can learn from your environment and help evolve different problems that you see in your space by learning from your environment. I think that that's a really important point. And I hear it a lot from people who are on the investor side of things saying like, number one, we're really tired of um, the overuse, I think, and misinterpretation of what it means to disrupt. But number two is understanding that what you need to do is create value and bring value to the marketplace. It doesn't matter where that is. It really just matters that how you're how you're delivering that value. Are you delivering it better than your competition? Because at the end of the day, that's really where your success is going to come from. And it's funny that you say that about the the Uber version of whatever. I mean, I hear it all the time from people who are like, "I've got this really great idea where you know the Uber yeah. for dogs," and I'm like, "I don't understand <laughs> what that means." You know? Yeah. Um, but I think that there's a lot of opportunity for the next generation of entrepreneurs to you know really cr look for niches because i think that in such a diverse economy we're going to have more opportunity to go really deep in something rather than to be really broad um, in that respect as well and um, we're pretty much here at time um, of our interview but i want to jump into our lightning round of questions if you're ready absolutely Awesome. So the first question um, I have for you is what do you know now about entrepreneurship that you wish that you knew then back when you entered in this startup world? Uh, I think the big thing for me is that you don't have to be this brilliant coding genius. Everybody has something to offer and has a value to contribute. And just because you may not be the next Steve Wozniak doesn't mean that you can't accomplish something great. You just have to be bold enough and willing to have the courage to try. That's awesome. In that same vein, what is the best piece of business advice that you've ever received? Uh, don't view your career as a sprint. It is actually a marathon. I think we get really hung up on the idea of every single month we have to be hitting some sort of internal benchmarks we've set on ourselves, which is great to have goals, but that doesn't mean that you have to become a billionaire overnight. It's still a marathon. That is such good advice. We have such a short attention span when it comes to <laughs> Success. Okay, this isn't on my list of things that I asked, but I've been meaning to ask you. Um, what do you think the millennial definition of success is? Uh, I think the millennial definition today is probably around, uh, I think it's some version of happiness. And that happiness gets defined in a really, really tailored and idiosyncratic way. Because I'll talk to individuals who say, happiness for me is making a difference in the world to somebody or a cause that I really care about. Or maybe for them, happiness is making a change in an industry that they think isn't necessarily approachable to consumers and they want to make 
someone have an opportunity that wasn't present before. But being able to generate the value is what creates happiness for themselves. And I think that type of tie is the cute, like the purest definition of instrumentality you've ever seen, like organizational behavior ever, is being able to tie what you do to something that matters to you, which makes you happy. That was very beautiful, actually. <laughs> um, all right, the next question is, what books are you reading right now? Uh, right now I'm reading The Everything Store, the book on Jeff Bezos. Loving it. It's a phenomenal novel. I'm not going to lie. It's probably one of my favorites, being able to hear his story. And it's really empowering to be able to hear both the successes, which are obviously numerous, but also the failures that went in that progress. And that's kind of what I read at night. And in the morning, I'm actually reading a research paper on women entrepreneurs within the Middle East, because I'm really interested to see how feminism takes shape with entrepreneurship in an environment that's so constrained when it comes to a lot of women's rights and how that's actually not always the case. That's awesome. I just recently finished Startup Nation, which is talking about entrepreneurship, particularly in Israel. And Israel. Some of the yeah, it's, it's really awesome. awesome Absolutely. Book. Wonderful. So, all right. So last question. Uh, so, Amanda, if the 12-year-old version of you were to meet you today, what would she think about what you do for a living? She probably think it was insane. Absolutely insane. <laughs> I think the 12 year old version of me always imagined that I would be kind of pursuing a very traditional line of work and trying to do things on the side that made me happy. And that was always, you know, oh, I'll do whatever that job is that you're supposed to from nine to five and then on the weekends and at night I'll have all of these passions where I'll be going to the theater and trying to help other young people look into pursuing their passions. But I had this very strict notion of you have your or real life that's the work hard and that's all that there is to it and then all the things that you're really passionate exist outside of it and then being able as an adult to come to the reality that there's actually an answer where you combine those things and you should do what you're passionate about for your work was a concept that I wasn't quite ready to understand when I was younger but I'm willing to embrace now seems like you've got a great perspective on what life and what work and <laughs> ultimately I mean what happiness is all about so I mean but thank you so much for taking the time to give us your perspective about what the next generation of entrepreneurs not only will look like but looks like right now thanks. absolutely thank you wonderful